All right. Good evening uh, to this wonderful panel. I want to uh, welcome you tonight to talk a little bit about this beautiful film, Writing with Fire, that oh, I'd always like to say Oscar nominated film, Writing with Fire. So tonight, I uh, want to thank those of you that are uh, here tonight to hear the panel discussion. And I want to thank the staff and crew at KPTC Television for all that they do behind the scenes to make this happen. And I want to introduce this wonderful panel, uh, panel of people that are here to talk about the film. And uh, first we have uh, Deanne Hamilton. And uh, then we have Dr. Darshana Minnie, who's coming to us tonight from Wisconsin. And we have Ellen Taylor, who's coming to us from Grand Rapids, Michigan. So I'm gonna ask each of you, uh, let's start with you, Ellen. Tell us a little bit about what you're doing. Oh, what I'm doing, Matt? Well, here, we'll give you a little history. <laughs> uh, I went to Seattle in 2011, where I was a morning show co-host on a country radio station, 100.7 The Wolf. And after a few years, I transitioned into television, where I was the morning features reporter on Q13 News. I know it's called Fox 13 now, but, um, and then of course, pandemic, which we all of course had to shift and things like that. And my job was to be the fun features reporter and there just was no room for fun <laughs> over the last two years. So uh, I am now out on my own. I host the Ellen Taylor show um, anywhere podcasts, YouTube places are heard, but um, really, yeah, transitioning. So I've got the old traditional media and the new media kind of under my belt, but that's a little bit about me and where I come from and where I'm at now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Dr. Uh, Darshana Mini, tell us a little bit about your what you're doing in Madison, Wisconsin. Hi, everyone. Um, so my name is Darshana Mini, and I'm an assistant professor at the Department of Communication Arts. And I teach South Asian media. That's one of my research areas. And I'm really glad to be here in this panel talking about this film. I got a chance actually to watch the film uh, when it started its first run in North America after the Sundance. So this is the third time I've watched the film. So it's it's very interesting to think about a film and its journey in three different phases. So glad to share my thoughts here. Thank Great, you. thank you so much for being here. And Ms. Deanne Hamilton, tell us a little bit about your experience as KBTC's executive director. Good evening, everyone. And thank you, Diane. It's great to have you leading this discussion tonight. Yes, I am the general manager and executive director of KBTC. I've been here for about five years, but I have a long uh, history of media. I graduated in journalism from the University of Washington, and I've worked in public media for hmm, a long time now. Um, and I've worked in commercial broadcasting. So I've been in commercial news. I've been in newspapers. I'm old, I've been around and I've done a lot. And this was a fabulous film and I'm looking forward to talking about it. And thank everyone for being here with us tonight. Great, thank you so much, Deanne. Um, I personally thought this was a phenomenal film. I really enjoyed every aspect of it. And um, I wanted to ask each one of you if you could comment uh, about how you felt after you saw the film. I think that's important to kind of layer it to some context of what you thought. And that could be whoever wants to start. I'd be happy to. Um, I felt it was a great film and it reminded me of the need that a lot of people have, have um, found in having their authentic voices represented. And if you think of the history of reporting and journalism, there have been a number of people who have broken ground to tell their own stories. And that's what I really thought was powerful and wonderful um, that these women had come together to tell very hard stories, but they were supporting each other and propelling each other forward, which was also quite wonderful to see. Um, so I thought it was, it, was, it was really heartwarming to watch the work that they were doing and dangerous work. And I'll, I'll leave it at that for, them, for the time being. Just to add to what Jane said, I think um, what stood out to me as someone who comes from India and knows about the caste system and the kind of oppressive structures that contain these women's lives, it was such a daring film to be made. And uh, you know, kudos to these women and Khabar Lahiri as a collective. 
um, who actually came forward and allowed these filmmakers to capture a, a glimpse of their lives because it's not easy um, for a film like this to be made in India when you have a right-wing government in power with their own kind of uh, political positions and ideologies. So uh, one thing to keep in mind is that it's a collective. It's women who are mentoring each other and trying to learn a new technology. And we are seeing the, uh, you know, Kabul Lehriya actually transition from print to digital, which I found to be very fascinating. And it also showcases the digital inequalities, right? Like people do not know English. They do not know how to use a, a smartphone, but they're still trying to do as much as they can in order to master the technology and use it for productive ends. Let's stop. And to kind of go off of what you were just saying, actually, it's the the fact that they really were not just dependent on each other, but they were pushing each other. They were checking each other and helping each other, of course, with the technology, because here it is at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what country you're in. Technology is going to continue to evolve and change. And we as journalists, storytellers, whatever it is that you describe yourself as you need to evolve with that, but also use it to your advantage to know that there's different platforms and ways to get your story that you're reporting across. And I think they did a really good job of using each other as resources, but then also it was like, okay, well, this person's doing that. I can do this. And it wasn't, they're going head to head. It was, we're all working towards one mission in this ever evolving world, which I thought was just fascinating. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Dr. Minnie, I'd like to know more about uh, if, no, if you would set a, a context for, this um, societal structure and why why was it so so amazing that women would be willing to take on uh, this independent journalism in this in Uttar Pradesh? Yeah, so what is interesting is that you know Khabar Leheria is based in Uttar Pradesh. And the particular uh, locality that where they're based in, it's very hard for women to come forward and form a collective. So Kabbal Leheria was started as a social experiment for six months. And then the women wanted to actually stick around and want to pursue journalism. So it's basically a, a, a particular experiment that has been taken up by the community and they wanted to actually be reporters and become professional. Um, and they wanted to actually make an impact. So you see this um, idea of impact and democracy being used quite a lot by these journalists because they want to see the social change that they never had. And that's what uh, is driving the passion. And they know the risks that are involved, but despite everything, I would say that you know the drive that each one of them have, I think that is what makes Khabar Lahiri of what it is. And just to give you a sense of the social structure, because um, we talk about these women as part of the Dalit community. So just to give you a sense of what caste means for those who do not know much about the Indian social context. So caste is a social stratification and it is based on um, in uh, which community, which caste group you are born into. And the community and the caste group you're born into will haunt you forever. And uh, if you want to just visualize how it looks like, let's think about a pyramid, a caste pyramid where Brahmins come at the top of this pinnacle of the pyramid, then comes the Kshatriya community of warriors, and then comes the merchant caste, and then finally comes the Shudras or uh, agricultural uh, laborers. And there are people who do not form part of this caste pyramid, who are outside the caste pyramid, and they are Dalits and uh, Adivasis, and Adivasis are indigenous community. And the word Dalit actually means broken, but mm -hmm. resilient. And I think that is where this drive is coming from, where they are not going to bow down to structures um, and you know oppression, but they want to fight back. They want to fight back and um, ask the rights that they are being guaranteed by the constitution. So um, just to give you a sense of how caste operates, there is uh, also very um, you know, rigid strictures of caste purity. Um, each caste, right from the you know, pinnacle, the caste which occupies the pinnacle of this pyramid, Brahmin, um, Kshatriya, Shudra, Vaishya and Shudra, all of them um, are actually bound by this idea of purity. The one who comes at the topmost is considered to be twice born or more purer than anyone else in the system. And Dalits are seen as impure. Mm -hmm. And all kind of you know, service, uh, like uh, sanitation work, and mm -hmm. all kind of labor intensive tasks, it's a Dalit community which does. And uh, it's important for us to talk about the Dalit community and the anti-caste mobilization in the context of US because we have a strong uh, diasporic community 
Uh, and one example would be the Quality Lab, uh, who, who runs a civil uh, rights kind of paradigm on the need to talk about caste, because you know, caste is not just in India, wherever the South Asian community migrates to, they take the caste practices with them. And I just want to add one more thing. And there is right now a strong mobilization to add caste as part of a protected category in the anti-discrimination uh, clauses of higher education, mainly mm -hmm. universities. And there are universities like Brandeis, uh, California State University, Colby College, um, and, University, uh, and UC Davis. Um, all of them have added this. And we are also like right now working in UW Madison to make this happen. So this is important conversation for all of us because we have a lot of South Asian Americans or you know, people who claim to be of South Asian descent here. So caste is something which is even uh, practiced in the context of US. Wow. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you're telling me that um, uh, these kinds of films and the kind of activities that we're seeing these women perform can actually have some impact on how the caste system is, is organized in India and in the United States. Right. So, you know, the caste is also organized around employment, right? So people who are Dalit, they are supposed to do like sanitation work mm -hmm. and bonded labor. Mm -hmm. And these are the people who are saying we want education. We want to enter into those realms of employment, which was denied to us for over generations. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and if you think about journalism in India, it is heavily, you know, upper caste people who dominate, you know, all, all kind of journalism, both print as well as visual media. So I think the formation of a Dalit collective and this uh, Kabbalahariya, they also have upper caste women working with them, Muslim women. So they, they are a collective, but the larger kind of, you know, motivation in order to break down the caste oppression is emerging from their own lived experience of having lived through this oppression. Always think about what Mira said, caste will follow me. Yeah. And I told my daughter, Castle will follow us forever because if you want to get a place, um, you know, to rent a place, they're going to ask you for your caste. Mm -hmm. And you might, might pass off as an upper caste, but if you are from that locality, it's very hard. You cannot hide your caste, right? You know, it, it's kind of out there and you cannot pass off as an upper caste. It's not easy. Wow. Thank you for that. That's really great context for our discussion. Comments, Deanne? Yeah, I'm just thinking that that they needed to come together. They needed to be able to express themselves. They needed to cover stories because other people are not going to do that for them or about them. And for them to do that, it just makes it the story that much more incredible and that they were so successful. I mean, they were talking about, I think at one point that their YouTube um there were 100,000 people watching. And then there was another, uh, you know, a few years later, it's over 5 million. So for them to have accomplished that is just an incredible story. And again, it was the camaraderie that we saw that, that also made it so strong and, and really so successful. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm getting goosebumps thinking about it. And you know, thank you so much for that context because it really did help. And if I can kind of jump in on that too, I went just out of pure curiosity, I went to their YouTube channel and their videos now are getting between two and 400 views. And I stopped for a second. I'm like, okay, well, like what, what might be going on here, but it doesn't matter what's going on here. Of course, now their channel is going to get flooded with the release of this film. Correct. But do those stories now with those lower views, does that mean that those stories aren't worth telling? Absolutely not right? But they're still continuing to tell those stories, mm -hmm. even though their views, which again, was remarkable throughout the film, have really kind of decreased. But that doesn't, again, change the importance of the work that they're doing and the stories that they need to tell and good on them, the resilience for continuing to do so. Uh, I love the mentoring that was happening in the film, woman to woman. And um, I'm old enough to know what mentoring felt like when in the 70s when the feminist revolution was um, raging here in the United States. And by the way, I never burned any underwear parts, but, um, but it was mentoring. And so there, that was a really strong theme of the film is to show how these women mentored to each other and supported each other. So would you guys like to chip in and talk a little bit about how maybe mentoring meant something to you at some point in your career? 
that, that was a game changer for me. And here's the thing is in the beginning of my career, I, there were a lot of men that helped me along the way. Okay. I am not one to say all oh, men held me down. There were some that did, but there were a lot that helped me along the way, but the women that helped me were the ones that made the most pivotal changes, not just in my career, but also in my life personally. And I think it's because we all do just like the women in the film, but I think just us as females in general, we know what we go through that we can't describe to anyone else. And so, I mean, a a woman hired me to go from radio to television, a woman who was a colleague of mine who branched out on her own about a month before I did had such great success that she, and I will cry just talking about it monetarily helped me without me even asking or saying anything. In fact, I told her no a million times over. And she said, the only thing she said was, I don't care what you do with this. I believe in you so much. The only thing I want you to do is pay it forward. And no man has told me that before. And I think it's again, because we understand what we have to go through to get where we've been. And so the only way that we can you know, really say thank you to those who have helped us is to, again, pay it forward. So I'm a big, big believer in that. And just to see that cross nations and countries and just that gist, regardless of where we live, like that, that's, that's powerful. That's very powerful. It truly is. How about you, Dr. Minnie? How about uh, speaking to mentorship? Yeah, um, I think, you know, the mentorship as a theme itself in the film stood out to me quite a lot. And like what Ellen said, it's so important to understand where you are in your journey. And if you see others who are kind of, you know, you know where they are going, but they might just need some help, assistance, guidance, direction, and pitching it without being asked to like help. I think that itself is that unconditional way of seeing the future generation. So uh, passing it forward, like, you know, pass this kind of, you know, whatever help and guidance you have received to the next generation, to the next set of people who come after you. And I think that is where I thought the film did it so beautifully. When uh, Mira is actually talking to Shamkali about the angle um, and the editorial kind of angle you need to have when you are collecting the story, talking with your respondents, I think that was beautiful. It was not um, about you know evaluating her work. It was not patronizing. It was just about trying to understand where Shamkali is coming from. And we see Shamkali's development, you know, over the period of um, like one hour's film that we see that Shamkali becomes much more confident and she is able to tackle technology. It's also about her gaining the mastery of technology. So I thought that this mentoring is what uh, makes this uh, grassroots level activism much more solid and rooted because it's not about ambition and aspiration for um, corporate jobs. You are in this community, you are going to report on Uh, issues that can have real life impact and people are going to talk about it because that's why you know um, roads that are you know that has have to be repaired and uh, after the story got released they got the government to do the kind of maintenance so I thought that was very interesting the the way in which women are taking the change forward. They're not waiting for anyone to come and help them out. And in this film, we don't see any men, you know, other than (laughs) Mira's husband. And I thought that was a very interesting editorial kind of choice that the filmmakers have used. Mm -hmm. We see him like, you know, lurking behind, but uh, he doesn't have a story. It's just about, you know, what he thought would fail and he's seeing that succeed. Yeah. Well, in that context, um, I got the impression that, um, and maybe I'm wrong about this, that he had to, it was kind of like a masculine thing that his wife had to perform certain housekeeping in order for him to stand with his, the men friends in in the village, right? That in order to hold his head up in male company, is that true? Is that he would get pressured by other males because his wife was so uh, evidently out in the public? Uh, it's also about the labor, the, you know, household labor is mostly done by women. So uh, even after Mira comes back, after her busy day of reporting, she comes and cooks. That's what we see. Yeah. And it's important for Kavida. If you remember, there was a sequence of Kavida telling him 
that the money is coming from Mira and her work. Yes. And I think that was an important move to say that you're constantly, you know, telling about the fact that she's not there and not taking care of the family, but you have to think about the source of your income and what does it mean for her to be an earning member of the family. So this idea of a breadwinner, I think they place that kind of angle very well in, ter in terms of capturing the domestic life of Mira. Yeah, that was very good. Um, I don't want to, I don't want to miss giving credit to uh, Rintu Thomas and uh, Sushmit Ghosh that were the directors of this film. Um, I thought, I thought it was really bold of them to, to do this film. Right. And um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about the recent statements that have come out um, about Kabar Loria and that have, that you have some more information on to share with the audience. So I have interviewed uh, Rintu and Sushmit uh, earlier in 2020. And, you know, in their uh, initial conversation itself, they were very keen to protect their respondents. Mm -hmm. And they told that the safety of her respondents is very important for us. So um, they even circulated a media kit to me, even though I'm an Indian and I know about the social context. And I really appreciated that gesture. Um, but we need to keep in mind the current political climate in India. And the Uttar Pradesh election has just happened. And all of this uh, moving parts has to be taken uh, into account. And the perspective should be there. Um, and I totally respect the statement because it's important for Kabul Lahiriya to reclaim their voice. It's their story. It's their narrative. Um, and without Kabul Lahiriya, there is no documentary. So I, I respect their story. It's important for them to put their narrative out there, but it's too early for us to take a stand on who is right on this. And I think, you know, it's important for us to also think that each documentary has a story to tell. And that story might not really be what they had discussed and negotiated four years back. Mm -hmm. The political situation changes, your own development as an organization changes in terms of the goals you have, your vision changes. So all of these are moving parts. And I think that's something we need to keep in mind. And this is a perfect example of what visibility can do, right? Visibility is a double-edged sword. Sometimes it can be very productive in spotlighting the excellent work Khabar Lahiri is doing. But after a point with the Oscar bid, when you know, it becomes like you know, micromanagement, you're looking too much at the organization, people are uncomfortable because these are women who are doing grassroots level work. And they have to stay there in Uttar Pradesh in the same locality while we have the luxury of sitting there and talking about the film. So I think it's all a matter of the privilege, the relative privileges. And I think we need to be um, aware of that and acknowledge. And I think Rintu and Shushmit in a statement that they circulated to me today, um, they had acknowledged the fact that, you know, they really respect the statement. And it's important for them to also say that there is no documentary without these women and their voices. So if the organization wants to come up with their statement, I think it's really within their, uh, you know, their rights to actually do that. And for us to watch the documentary for what it is yeah. with all the nuances. And it's a very complicated picture of India that it is giving us. And it's important for us to keep in mind, there were journalists who were killed brutally in India. So the safety of the Khabar Lahiriya and the journalists is of utmost importance for all of us. We are not just watching the documentary. We want to ensure that these women are safe, not just right now with the Oscar bit, but in the future as well. Thank you for that. There is an audience question about how uh, these women are funded. Can you speak to that? Um, so from my limited knowledge uh, and in my conversation with the filmmakers, what I understood was that when they started as a social experiment, there was an NGO which supported them with the skill set. And then they wanted to continue as an organization. And what they do is they basically, uh, when they were in the print format, they printed the newsletters and they distributed it. Ah. So that was how they build this kind of connection with the community. And right now, uh, you know, the revenue is emerging from uh, how they're able to actually market, uh, market this um, newsletter. Um, right now, they don't have a print newsletter, but they do have a very vibrant WhatsApp community, which is very interesting for us in the US to think about. We wouldn't think about news portals subscribing to, you know, WhatsApp as one way of circulating the news. And again, it's a vernacular language that they're using, which can connect people very easily as opposed to English language media. So that is a source of revenue. And, um, and I think they are doing pretty well. I think what makes Khabar Lahiri very different from other corporate um, you know, media houses 
is that they really believe in what they do in terms of the impact that they want to see. So, so they do find a way to give each, each person who's working with them some stipend. Right. So uh, from what I understand, they have a salary. Yeah. And uh, there is a sequence in the film where, you know, there is an internal review where uh, it's been told how many um, news uh, reports were covered by each of the reporters. Mm -hmm. So my guess is that they do have a target because, you know, one person is told that they haven't managed to reach the target. So uh, we could find some kind of internal mechanism that they might have in terms of salary payment, in terms of the job that individual journalists do, but it's not uh, freelancing. They're working for cover letter. They are. Thank you. Thank you for that answer. Um, did you want to speak to mentoring, Ms. Hamilton? You know, um, I think mentoring, yeah, I, I've had, you know what it is? When someone tells you, and I think Ellen is the one who said this, I believe in you. It makes a tremendous difference. You know, when I watched uh, the hearings, um, the Supreme Court hearings this week, and when Senator Booker told the judge that she mattered, that made a huge difference. And I think that when you get that kind of support from either gender, male or female, I've had mentors of both genders, it's just important to know that, yes, yeah, someone actually has your back yeah. <laughs> and they're gonna help you through whatever challenge you may be facing and you know help you in any way that they can. I think that, you know, and I agree with you, Ellen, you gotta pay it forward, you know? Got to, there's another generation coming behind me. I have to support that generation and make sure that they have, you know, equity, equality in the experiences and be included in the work that's being done. And journalism is such an important, uh, has, you know, plays such an important role in our, our society. And we have to let people know that we, you know, we believe in their work. We believe in the truth. We believe in fairness and accuracy. And that I got that sense from the coverage that they were uh, providing there in the documentary. Um, and they knew what stories they were gonna tell and they knew how they were gonna tell them. And they knew that they were not going to stray into my personal opinion. Um, but that, because they wanted to have that impact, as you, you said, Dr. Minnie, um, and they did. They showed us that there was impact from the reporting that they were doing. So just having that foundation and knowing that someone's got your back is, I think, really, really important. And one thing that I didn't even consciously realize until Dr. Minnie said it was to mentor and help people without them asking, because that automatically put me in spaces where someone helped me. And I never felt like, oh, like, why are they helping me? Like, you don't get offended when someone comes and genuinely tries to help you. I don't know about anybody else, but I have a very hard time asking for help. That doesn't mean that I don't need it. But when someone does help you, genuinely help you without being asked, Dr. Minnie, I'm going to make a conscious effort of doing that now to other women because you are so right. It, it, that it's a different feeling when it comes without being asked. So that, thank you for bringing that up. That's very good. Very good. Um, I, I love this line. I believe journalism is the essence of democracy. That's a quote uh, from Mira in the film. And I, I really, you know, that's really a challenge right now in our country where people are wondering how, how journalism is going to shake out. And, and we know the impact that has on democracy. So um, I'd love to have each of you kind of comment on that, on that line. Would you please, for our audience? Um, go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, so I think, you know, democracy is the core uh, structure around which free press is situated. And I think what Mira is trying to say is that, you know, after years, people would ask what were, we, what were journalists doing when there is a transition, then all of these things were happening, where were the reporters? So she personally takes it as a responsibility the reporters should have for uh, free press. And I think uh, that is where I thought Kabbalaharia was kind of trying to brainstorm ideas on what, what does it mean to actually have a free press in a country when your voice is being constantly challenged and constrained. And they're also working with a lot of limitations. So uh, what does it mean to have a free press 
with this limitations already uh, limiting your way to actually engage with the story so i thought that was a very important moment for us to also think about this particular film this documentary uh, trying to look at a collective in this moment of transition from print to digital where digital brings visibility it brings them uh, to the zone of you know hyper surveillance and i thought that this idea of mobile phone was a very interesting way of trying to look at the idea of surveillance technologies in the context of india we see all the you know, journalists using the mobile phone to capture the stories and edit it but we also see sequences where they are also being recorded by people around them so i think it was interesting to look at a gaze and counter gaze and try and see how um, you know they are also trying to negotiate this transition from print where they don't really have to record anything and the camera actually changes everything in terms of dynamics and if you remember the sequence where they um, uh, i think it was um, I don't know who it was uh, they actually go and uh, report on a, a road which is kind of the construction has not been done and people are really violent and initially you know the the crowd is hostile but then things change so i think it's interesting for uh, conversations on democracy to have the right language to talk on what journalism means in terms of having systemic changes implemented and i think that was a conversation the journalist was having with the crowd trying to convince why the story has to be there yeah yeah that was a that was a tense moment yeah. in the film yeah i feel like when i'm watching this i thought to i literally thought to myself why aren't I doing more? I live in a country where there is free press, right? And it doesn't, you don't need to work at a news station in order to have the ability to report on what's going on. This is all you need. Right. And I stopped myself and I said, why am I not doing more? Because I'll be very transparent. I am I associate every part of who I am in my work. It's not healthy, but I'm working on it. But with that being said, going from a traditional news, right? I work in television, I'm, you know, on the morning news to now I'm on my own. It's hard for me to feel like my self-worth is at where it was before when I had that title, right? Mm -hmm. And seeing these women and the adversity and what they face, the obstacles that they face, I have no excuse, none. So I think us that live in this country need to like, yes, we have privilege, but don't take advantage of that. Now do something about it. Get out of your own head. You don't need a title. You don't need anything behind you. You need this. We all have this. Nothing, nothing can stop you. So get out of your own way and start telling the stories because if those women can do it, you sure as hell can too. I love that, Ellen. Well, I just get really passionate about it, obviously. Obviously. Okay, so get busy, Ellen. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think that 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 uh, journalism is the key to democracy, but but it, what is underscored is the truth and accuracy because there's yes ellen you could use that phone and you can say whatever you want and you can post it on the internet and you know if people there's a level of credibility that journalists have to build and you know it's tied into how people trust the work that they're doing if you're pulling someone's leg if you're lying to them or if you're trying to convince them that there's a conspiracy going on i'll probably get in trouble for saying that but you know um then that's not the truth that's not about democracy it's not about trying to have an informed citizenry um information is what helps us make decisions about our lives. And I think that that is what was demonstrated in this film. They wanted to tell stories that would make a difference in people's lives. They got roads built. They got you know um, canals built because they were telling the story of those things that used to exist, but didn't exist any longer. And why not? What is the government doing? And how are they harming you know, people's lives? So we really have to think about credibility and we have to think about how we need to have trusted sources and people need to know how to figure out 
if someone is telling the truth or pulling their leg. Um, and the other thing I would say is that if, um, if journalism wasn't key to democracy, there wouldn't be so many people trying to silence journalists in the world. And we're seeing that happening, you know, uh, right now uh, with the Ukraine and Russia, um, and so many people trying to to put other messages out there that are not that we think are not true. I, mean, I don't know. I listen to NPR. Uh, I trust NPR. Um, so you know, always have a trusted source um, that you can, you know, believe that the information that you're receiving is is you know true and accurate. And thank you for checking me on that because you, you're totally right. Everyone has a microphone now. Everyone has a platform, but not everyone mm, uses it the way that it should be used. So you're right. Building credibility. Thank you for checking me on that. Um, but then also I really take a lot of... Eh, a strong stance on the fact that we as individuals, if you are going to be a journalist, is making a brand for yourself. I'm not saying the stories need to be about you because they are never about you, but to be conscious of the brand that you're building for yourself, because then that will start laying the groundwork for trust with the viewers, the listeners, the readers, whatever platform you're on, but also those who you might be going to for interviews, questions, concerns, right? Because now if you're building that credibility as well. And that really comes from your brand. And I think in the past, it's been, okay, you're a journalist that's separate. You're behind the scenes, but that was before. And I don't think that necessarily translates very well. I think there's a way to use having your own personal brand to your advantage. But like Deanne was saying, don't use it for lack of a better term, evil. Yeah. That's a great term. <laughs> it is. Um, you know, uh, I noticed that when uh, I lived in Asia for about 10 years and I noticed that um technology developed in a different way in some of the Asian countries. Uh, it, it moved forward faster. Like I saw technology that was being utilized in Asia that we hadn't actually, we weren't using in, in any big capacity here in the United States. And, and so, it would, you know, it kind of leapfrogs. They don't wait around and go through all the phases. They just move on to the next. So that's, that's kind of what the idea of them using their cell phones, getting cell phones and unwrapping them very ca carefully and, and looking at them and trying to figure out this new technology. So that brings me to a question about future journalism and, and women in the media. And uh, all of that is transitioning, as we know, away from print media. It's harder and harder now to, for a print media to, to survive. So do you have any comments, Dr. Minnie or Ellen or uh, Deanne about like the leapfrogging of technology that people can be thinking about uh, beyond the cell phone? I, I don't really think that you can predict what's going to happen. You just need to continue to be flexible with whatever technology is going to throw our way because like you said, Diane, it's going to happen whether we want it to or not. I know. And listen, I don't know if it's because I'm at that age or what's going on, but I have so many friends that are like, I'm not going to jump on this TikTok thing because that's for kids. Mm -hmm. And it's gotten to the point where I'm telling my friends who have always been very savvy on top of the new technology, the new platforms. I'm like, you guys are missing out because if you keep thinking that that's what it is without even taking the time to see what's going on, you're missing out and you are going to be, what's the problem, right? You are part of the problem. Technology, things evolve and grow. Yeah. It gets harder to learn and catch on to the older you get. But if you are dedicated to what it is that you're doing, you need to. It's part of something that you just need to do right. in order to reach the masses that you're trying to get to. Yeah. Well, as Dr. Minnie mentioned, WhatsApp is a huge way for them to distribute their, uh, their media. Yeah, just to add on to what uh, Ellen said, I'm also thinking about the way um, sometimes, you know, during the pandemic, um, the OTT platforms uh, massively kind of canvas subscribers in India. And we saw like rise of like 200%, you know, subscribers in a matter of like um, 
seven to eight months in India, which is also interesting because, you know, the um, markets in global south operates very differently. And there is always this way of uh, technology uh, being used for things which they're not meant to be. For instance, uh, TikTok um, was banned in India, but before it was banned, it was a very popular medium used by, uh, you know, people coming from historically marginalized background like Dalits and Adivasis to actually capture their lives. So it is not just being used only for influencer culture. It's also being used by people to actually try and fiddle with it and try and see what, what else can you do with it that, was, that you were deprived of. So it's interesting that the film is actually pointing us towards the future of journalism in India, where uh, it need not be a, a corporate media who's going to lead the way forward. It could just be uh, women-led collectives who are able to get the support, uh, financial support and backing, or able to make stories. And again, there is this local story aspect that is emphasized in the documentary about Kabbalah Haria. They're not really interested in the national. They're interested in the national here because Uttar Pradesh elections were the ones they were reporting. But they're, they're also very interested in understanding what is panning out in the local neighborhood groups. And I thought this idea of shifting the national paradigm to a local and try and understand how does the local peripheral cultures speak to the nation is a very interesting move. And Uttar Pradesh is a state where the election of Uttar Pradesh in terms of which party comes to power decides the whole uh, national kind of, you know, uh, scheme of what which party will come to power. So I think and it's very important that the documentary played with that idea of what does it mean for this women to actually try and use whatever limited uh, capabilities they can using a mobile phone to understand, um, you know, how they can work with technology. And if you remember that sequence where they had met a politician and came out of the house and they were taking some coverage shots and he was a little reluctant. And then they tried to convince him saying that we, everyone will be bored looking at your face. So we need coverage shots. And I thought that was like interesting, you know, trying to convince someone who's come to actually shout at them and tell them that this is what we do. And this is what journalism means. So using the basic vocabulary to drive home the idea of women as journalists, I thought that was a very empowering move. It was, it was. And uh, our audience did mention that they saw these women grow in confidence. That, that's a very, uh, that's the empowering part of the film is that it just starts out building on itself. And you see these women becoming more and more confident. It was wonderful. And I think it's because they had each other, right? Like right. I've had people, and again, I was like the fun, feature reporter that got to go out and do fun things. And I would have people who are like, oh, well, can you send that to me before you air it? Because I just want to make sure that I didn't make a mistake. And even me, I was like, um, uh, like, I mean, I never did, but I was like, uh, no, like, and I, and I'm not clearly a timid or shy person, but I think because they had each other, they knew like, okay, if, you know, what would someone else in my group that I know, what would they do? And it gave them the guts mm -hmm. to do that as well, which I think they do something better than I ever did. This, this film really uh, calls for a follow-up film in five or 10 years, because it would be wonderful to see those women five or 10 years from now and where they're, where they are in their society, societal structure. It'd be great to see that. Um, uh, I don't ever like to leave a good panel uh, conversation uh, uh, without talking about what we can do, watching the film, people, the audience could, could do in their own way to support independent media of this sort and, and maybe even granularly this, this group of women. Do you have comments about how we can support women in media? besides supporting our local KBTC television. Well, yeah, and that's exactly what you, you were reading my mind because you knew I was going to say, well, you know, you could become a member, a donor. I mean, I think that public media, <laughs> public media has provided so many opportunities for independent producers and journalists. And I think that kind of gets lost because everybody thinks of us as the education channel. But when you have series like Independent Lens and you have POV. Um, those are independent producers and reporters who are putting that work together. They're not you know, 
in a newsroom necessarily. They might be in, you know, hanging out at WGBH in Boston, but there's a lot of independent voices that come through public media. And we can only do this with the support that we receive from our donors. But there's also, I was going to suggest that there are um, the 19th, it's, it's, it's a new uh, online um, uh, site that came about around the 19th Amendment, and they're reporting on women and women in elections and politics and the intersection of, of women out there doing things. I think if you look for um, outlets that appeal to you. And, and as Ellen has said, it's about brand and it's about having built that trust. Um, so, you know, sample different um, sites, sample, um, you know, different TV shows or, or TV stations. <laughs> I know I'm gonna stop talking about that because I know everybody knows we're public media that, and we do ask for, for support. But yeah, to look for those voices that uh, reflect your thoughts um, and even those that anger you because that's how you learn. You know, if you listen to something that just turns your stomach, you're gonna learn something from it. And it's really uh, of value to do that. Um, and those are independent voices as well. So um, I just, it's very important to support independence. So I'll stop talking now. Why don't know? <laughs> That's wonderful. And Ellen, how do we, how do we get into the Ellen Taylor show? Well, um, wait, how do you get into the Ellen Taylor show? You just Google it. Yeah, I, really. I mean, at the end of the day, yeah, just Google it. The Ellen Taylor show, ellentaylor.com. But anyway, but when you ask about what can I do, I looked at it from a different angle, right? Okay. Different angle than yeah. Deanne, which was what can I do to support independent media? Well, first off, let's talk about you being the independent media, right? From that perspective and that angle. First off, I'm a firm believer in you are the company that you keep. And I think this film really proved it, right? Surround yourself, not with necessarily people like Deanne was saying that you agree with, but people whose work you either aspire to be or motivated by, or you feel like you can learn something from. What is the saying? If you are the smartest person in the room, you need to get into a new room. <laughs> Firmly believe in all of that, but also remember that you never know who's watching. And I mean that in the best way. You never know who you're inspiring. So on days where you feel like, and I'm going to try and practice what I preach because I know that it's hard. But on the days where you're struggling and you're like, why am I doing this? Is this worth it? I'm in a rut or whatever. There's going to be somebody that's watching you, maybe the next generation or maybe one of those lurkers, because I know not everyone is commenting on my Instagram or my TikTok that I post. They are lurking, but that doesn't mean that you know, like you're not affecting them. You're not inspiring them. You're not motivating them. So always keep that in the back of your mind. Someone's always watching you and it's not always to critique you. It's to be motivated by you. And it is your responsibility, right? To help further this independent journalism in the best way possible. And the best way that you can do that is to practice what you preach and be what you want others to be. Perfect. I love it. Dr. Minnie, how about you? Um, I think that, you know, as a media studies scholar and researcher, I think um, I'm curious also to emphasize the mode of production, how a particular media is produced and use that as one way of, you know, directing the audience and my students as well on the ethical and moral questions that we need to reckon with when we watch the media. And that is why, you know, independent media productions, where they come from, uh, the particular mode has to be emphasized and what kind of audience that they are envisaging and the impact that it would have. Um, so, you know, just to have the conversation on cast to begin with in a panel discussion like this, I'm sure has given at least our audience a sense of what is the greater challenge for these women. They are born to this particular cast and they cannot let go of that. But within those limitations, they are trying to do everything possible to unshackle patriarchy. Think of an intersectional perspective. And that's where I would say that, you know, the, like what I think, you know, Deanne and Ellen refer to the fact that we necessarily need not agree uh, with each other, but it's also to uh, understand where each strand is coming from. So the different shades of feminism rubbing against each other, but each one learning what is it that is at stake for us when we are fighting a bigger enemy which is patriarchy. So I think an intersectional approach is where I would go with this. Thank you. I think that's wonderful. That's really great. Well, we're gonna, we're gonna wind down our panel discussion now. 
And uh, again, I just want to I want to really thank each one of you for being here tonight. And um, I, I do want to ask one last question of you, Deanne, and that is um, if other people that are watching would like to get this film to show to their audiences, and I'm saying that selfishly because of Meaningful Movies, Tacoma, but um, can we reach out to KBTC and ask for permission to uh, show this again someday? Well, we would have to work with Independent Lens because we are you know, obligated to them. It's their film. Yeah. Uh, and we only have a certain amount of rights that, that we, you know, uh, licensed rights. It will be um, available on the PBS app. I don't know how long it will be on the PBS app. Okay. Um, so it can be shared out, certainly. And, okay. um, but, you know, down the road, if there's something that comes up, we can certainly reach out to Independent Lens to find out, you know, if this is available. Um, the filmmakers really control their own product. Sure. And this is, you know, theirs uh, to control. But, mm -hmm. you know, if they want to have wide distribution, and they might, you know, we might be able to work something out, but we would certainly look into it for you or other people out there um, if they want to show. Right now, you can share it out as much as you want. And don't forget to watch the Oscars over the weekend to see if they win. <laughs> yes. So, um, we do. Yeah. So, so, yeah, share it now. And you can watch it as much as you want on the PBS app. Uh, right? And we're airing it. Uh, on April 5th at 11 o'clock. Um, I believe that uh, Sherry will let us know if I've messed up on the time and date. Uh, so and those uh, be sure you can watch it. Hmm? People who are signed up as members of KBTC would get that automatically in their inbox, <clears throat> a reminder. Yes, and they can, if they qualify for Passport, they can watch it on Passport as well. So we have a lot of different avenues that we can, um, um, you know, have this available to people. And I want to say thank you too. I mean, I am KBTC and, and my team uh, are so wonderful, um, but we do appreciate each of you giving of your time and, and efforts uh, to make this. I think it was a very lively and, and really heartwarming conversation. So I want to thank you as well. Yeah. And Diane, yes, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> all right, well, thank you ladies. And uh, I wish you all the very best this year. Thank you, guys. You are welcome. See you soon. <laughs> Bye. Bye. -bye.